Alrighty, so I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and we are going to be diving deep into chapter five of Becoming Supernatural. So chapter five, Becoming, alrighty. Sorry about that. So we're going live on chapter five, Reconditioning the body to a new mind, becoming supernatural. So thanks for tuning in, tapping into this read, review, and apply, and apply or application of the concepts in the Becoming Supernatural book. So let's get started. So in this chapter, we're going to discuss how to do a breathing technique we use before we start many of our meditations. And I'm gonna explain it in detail here because understanding how this works is vital to your ability to truly change your energy and free your body from the past. So as you'll see, the proper use of the breath is one of the keys to becoming supernatural. To get all the benefits of this technique, your knowledge of what you will be doing and why you are doing it will serve us as the foundation for the experience. And so we'll make this will make the how easier for you, not to mention making the technique more effective. So once you understand the actual physiology of how this particular breath works, you'll be able to assign meaning to this activity. Put more attention behind it and do it properly and experience all the benefits of using breath to pull a mind out of the body and then recondition your body to a new mind. So before we start, I want to review the thinking feeling loop we discussed in chapter two, because the concepts are central to the meditation in this chapter. And as you will recall, thoughts cause biochemical reactions in your brain that actually release chemical signals. And those chemical signals make the body feel exactly the way you were just thinking. So those feelings, then cause you to generate more thoughts that make you feel the same way you were just thinking. So your thoughts drive your feelings and your feelings drive your thoughts. And eventually this loop hardwires your brain into the same patterns, which conditions your body into the past. And because emotions are a record of your past experiences, if you can't think greater than how you actually feel, this thinking, feeling loop keeps you anchored to your past, and now it creates a constant state of being. So this is how the body becomes the mind, or in time, how your thoughts run you and your feelings and actually own you. So once your body becomes the mind of that emotion, your body is literally in the past. And since your body is your unconscious mind, it's it is so objective that it does not know the difference between the experience in your life that creates the emotion and the emotion you are creating by thought alone. So I'm going to read that again because I think that's a real pivotal point and a thing to acknowledge. Once your body becomes the mind, think about that, your body, your physical body becomes the mind. So once your body becomes the mind of that emotion, your body is literally in the past. And since your body is your unconscious mind, it is so objective that it does not know the difference between the experience in your life that creates the emotion and the emotion you are creating by thought alone. Once you are caught in this thinking, feeling loop, the body believes it is living in the same past. So experiencing it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So the body believes it is in the same past experience because to the body, the emotion is literally the experience. This is really, really important, especially if you su suffer from nervousness, anxiety, worry, that's all emotion that's trapped in your body from a previous experience, but your thought in the now is pulling the past from your body into your now. So that's that thinking feeling loop that he's talking about. So let's say you've had a few difficult experiences in your life that have 
branded you emotionally, and you've never got over the fear, the bitterness, the frustration and resentment, and those experiences that are engendered. So every time you have an experience in your external environment that is similar in some way to what happened previously, that experience triggers you and you feel the same emotions that you did at the same time that you had that first event. And once you feel the same emotion you felt 30 years ago when the event actually initially occurred, it's quite possible that you will behave in the same way you did at the time because those emotions are driving your conscious or unconscious thoughts and behaviors. So now those emotions have become so familiar to you that you believe that's who you are. By the time you are in your mid thirties, if you keep thinking, acting and feeling the same without changing anything about yourself, the majority of who you are becomes a memorized set of automatic thoughts, reflexive emotional reactions, unconscious habits and behaviors, subconscious beliefs and perceptions and the routine familiar attitudes. So in fact, 95% of who we are as adults is so habituated through repetition that the body has been programmed to be the mind and the body, not the conscious mind is basically running the show. That means that only 5% of who you are is conscious and the remaining 95% is a subconscious body mind program. It's amazing. So in order to create something significantly different in our lives, we must find a way to pull the mind out of the body and change our state of being, which is exactly what the meditation I will teach you at the end of this chapter is designed to do. So how energy gets stored in the body. Now let's look at how the thinking feeling loop works in relation to the body's energy centers that we discussed in the previous chapter, especially the first three, the survival centers, where it causes the most problems. That's because most people's thoughts and feelings activate those energy centers. So as you remember from the previous chapter, each of the body's energy centers has its own individual energy, information, glands, hormones, chemistry, neurocircuitry, and its own individual mini brain or mind, or really each has a mind of its own. These mini brains become programmed in the body to operate subconsciously through the autonomic nervous system. In this way, each center has its own energy and corresponding level of consciousness, and each is associated with specific emotions corresponding to that particular center. So let's say you think of a thought such as, my boss is unfair. Figure 5.1 in the book depicts how thinking that thought turns on a neurological network inside your brain. And then you, you have another thought, I'm underpaid and you turn on a second neurological network. And then you think, I'm overworked. Now you're off to the races because mind is the brain in action. Again, I'm gonna repeat that, because mind is the brain in action. If you keep thinking more thoughts along the same lines and you activate enough networks of neurons wiring and firing in tandem in a specific sequence and pattern and combination, you produce a level of mind, which then creates an internal representation or an image of yourself in your brain's frontal lobe. That's where you can make your internal thoughts more real than your outer environment. In this case, you see yourself as an angry person. If you accept, believe, and surrender to that idea, that concept, or that image, without any analysis, the neurotransmitters, chemical messengers that send information in between the neurons in your brain that produce that level of mind begin to influence neuropeptides, which are chemical messengers created by an autonomic nervous system within the limbic brain. Think of neuropeptides as molecules of emotion. Those neuropeptides signal hormonal centers in this case, turning on the adrenal glands in the third energy center. 
It's no wonder people have adrenal fatigue. As the adrenal glands release their hormones, you're feeling pretty ticked off and you broadcast a specific energy signature through the third energy center that's right here in your solar plexus that in effect carries the message send me another reason to feel the way i'm already feeling send me another reason to feel angry as this center becomes activated it produces a specific frequency that carries a particular message so this graphic demonstrates how we are how we store energy in the form of emotions in our third center as a result of getting caught in a very specific thinking and feeling loop so your brain monitors your chemical state and the moment you feel angry it's going to think more corresponding thoughts equal to how you feel so my boss is such a jerk i should quit my job what an idiot driver my co-worker stole my idea i'm right and everyone else is wrong it fires and wires similar circuits in the same way over and over again if you turn on enough of those circuits you keep producing that same level of mind this reaffirms your identity with the same image in your forebrain and then the limbic brain creates more of the same neuropeptides, which then signal the same hormones from your third energy center, right here, right at your gut, in your solar plexus. And you start to feel even more angry and frustrated, which then influences you to think more of the same corresponding thoughts. The cycle can go on for decades, whether that which you are thinking is justified or not. And when the redundancy of the cycle hardwires the brain into a certain pattern, in this case, the pattern of anger, and repeatedly conditions the body emotionally to the past, the body then becomes the mind of anger. So the anger is no longer in the mind that's in your brain, the 5% of your thought that is conscious, but instead, the emotion of anger becomes stored as energy in the body mind so it's actually lodged into your actual flesh the mind that is in your cell memory the 95 percent of your mind that is subconscious so you're not aware that you're doing this but that is exactly what is happening so all that emotion which was originally created from thought because all thoughts have a corresponding energy, of course, and it becomes stored as energy in the body, stuck in your third center, the solar plexus. This stored energy produces a corresponding biological effect. In this case, it could be adrenal fatigue, digestive problems, kidney issues, or a weakened immune system, not to mention other psychological effects like a short temper, impatience, frustration, or intolerance. Over the years, you keep producing the same thoughts that keep signaling the same feelings and you continue hardwiring your brain into this very finite pattern and in the same way you keep reconditioning the body to become the mind of anger. So thus an enormous amount of your creative energy is stored in your body's third energy center as anger. Bitterness, frustration, intolerance, impatience, control, or hatred. Sidebar here. I would even uh, add to this, in addition to the bitterness, frustration, intolerance, impatience, control, and hatred that he mentions, you know, you have people who are addicted to having, you know, this continuous chain of every 10 years or every seven years, having a dark night of the soul. You have depression. You just have this woe is me kind of a persona and kind of a victim mentality. And you can't get out of that loop because you're not, you're unaware that you're listening to your ego and your brain and the emotions that are lodged into your body simply because you've never been trained to pay attention to your awareness and your mind, who you're true, who you truly are. The awareness that's the observer is different from the thinking brain, from the egoic brain and the emotions that are, they're betraying you because once you're aware of them, 
and you've decided that you're not angry, you're not scared, you're not whatever, you fill in the blank that you're only in a pure state of love, anything that's not love is basically a lie. So that's part of what this, this work is about self mastery and the identification of you as the truest, purest sense of love. It's the most complete, the quickest, most efficient, I would almost say guaranteed way to become whole and completely aware of who you are and who you are not. Because your personal reality creates your personality, as Dr. Joe says. And so this is teaching you how to create the personality that you truly want for you, which is the embodiment of love, because love heals all things. It's the most powerful energy that exists, period. Back to the book. What if instead of feeling angry, you start having thoughts that make you feel victimized or guilty? Life is too hard. I'm a bad parent. I shouldn't have been so rude. Did I do something wrong? If you take a look at figure 5.2, you'll see that the same thing happens. Thinking those thoughts turns on a different network of neurons in your brain. If you fire and wire enough of those networks, you produce a different level of mind and the brain creates the internal image of yourself that reaffirms your identity. And in this case, as a guilty person. You start thinking, God's going to punish me. Nobody loves me. I'm worthless. I'm useless. Blah, blah, blah. You go down that downward spiral. Once you accept, believe, and surrender to these guilty thoughts without any analysis, your neurotransmitters activating neural networks in your brain influence a different blend of neuropeptides this time neuropeptides that are equal to those thoughts about feeling guilty and then those neuropeptides signal a different hormonal center in this case the second center that's two inches below your belly button the second center and over time as you recreate the same loop of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking you're going to begin to store your energy in the body in the second center this begins to produce a biological effect. Since you feel guilt in your gut, you may start to feel nauseated or sick, or you may experience pain in this area of your body, along with emotions like suffering, unhappiness, or even sadness. So this graphic demonstrates how we store energy in the form of emotions in our second center as a result of getting caught in a different thinking and feeling loop. If over time you keep feeling guilty, you think more guilty thoughts that fire and wire more neurons and signal more neuropeptides that cause the release of more hormones in the second center. So as this happens, you continue to condition the body to become the mind of guilt and suffering. So you're storing more and more energy as emotion in the second center. You also continue to broadcast a specific energetic signature carrying specific information through the second energy center into your body's energetic field. So now let's say that you start having a totally different set of thoughts. What happens if you have sexual fantasies about someone? Now you're turning on a different network of neurons in your brain and you're producing a different level of mind. And just as before, if you get enough of those networks wiring and firing and wiring and firing, you're going to get a different internal representation in the frontal lobe of your brain. And once the thought or image you are paying attention to becomes more real than your outer world, in that moment, the thought literally becomes the experience. And the end product of that experience is the corresponding feeling. So as a result, your body gets turned on. That center is now activated with a specific energy carrying a specific message or intent, which then turns on the individual plexus of neurons in that center to produce a specific mind, which then signals genes in the corresponding glands to make chemicals and hormones equal to those thoughts. 
I'm going to reread that last one. So as a result, your body gets turned on and that center is now activated with a specific energy carrying a specific message or intent, which then turns on the individual plexus of neurons in that center to produce a specific mind, which then signals genes in the corresponding glands to make chemicals and hormones equal to those thoughts. Now you're convinced you're the stud or vixen of the universe. And if you accept, believe, and surrender to that thought or image of yourself without any analysis, then those neurotransmitters in the brain will, of course, begin to influence a different blend of neuropeptides in the limbic brain. They'll signal hormones in the first energy center, programming the autonomic nervous system to prepare that center to become activated. I think you're very familiar with the biological effects that happen next. Those biological reactions will cause you to keep feeling a certain way and you're going to think more corresponding thoughts equal to that feeling. And now you're storing energy in the first energy center and you are broadcasting a vibrational signature carrying a specific message from that center into an energy field in your body. So your brain is so your brain is now monitoring how you're feeling and you're going to generate even more corresponding blah, do over your brain is monitoring how you're feeling and you're going to generate even more corresponding thoughts and the cycle continues so this is how the body responds to the mind and ultimately becomes the mind so now you understand how your thoughts condition your body to become the mind of whatever emotion you are experiencing and how. When that happens, you're storing more energy in the corresponding energy center for that emotion. The center where the majority of that energy gets stored is the one associated with the emotions you have been repeatedly experiencing. So if you are overly lustful, oversexed, or overly preoccupied with wanting to be seen by others as sexually desirable, your energy is stuck in your first energy center. If you experience an overabundance of guilt, sadness, fear, depression, shame, unworthiness, low self-esteem, suffering and pain, your energy will become stuck in your second energy center. And if you have problems with anger, aggression, frustration, control, issues, judgment, self-importance, your energy is stuck in your third energy center. So hopefully by now you have done the blessing of the energy centers meditation and have begun to experience how the energy in each of your centers is able to evolve from one center to the next center, increasing its frequency as it moves up the body. In time, the body becomes the mind of that emotion. And once that energy as an emotion is stored, or more accurately, once it becomes trapped in one or more of the lower energy centers, then the body is literally in the past. This means you no longer have energy available to create a new destiny. When that happens, your body becomes more matter and less energy. Because as you've read, the first three centers, which are based on survival emotions, shrink the vital field of energy surrounding your body. So think about it. Just one energy center, by you being off kilter, just with one of your energy centers, it will shrink your energy field around your body. Um, there are some of us who can actually see auric fields, and you can see that people have different colored auras, um, not just a, a singular colored aura. You can see that they have sometimes two, three different colors. Sometimes um, there are holes in the aura or there are black spots in the aura. I'm not going to get into all the meaning of that. Other times you can feel a person's aura where it's like you could feel their energetic aura, which is their Taurus field, also known as your electromagnetic field. You can feel the density and you could feel the width of the aura. And typically your aura can normally fan out up to eight or nine feet in, uh, 
eight or, eight or nine feet in width in either direction because it's you know all the way around. It's kind of shaped kind of like an apple. So having one of your energy centers blocked is going to make your energy field and in essence your energy is shrinking and it can comp if you have more than one of these energy centers let's say if you have your first or second and your third energy center um, collapsed and blocked where the energy is not flowing through all of them because they're it's lodged in any one of those three or all three then your electromagnetic field is definitely shrunk down so to be clear back to the book i'm not saying that you shouldn't ever have sex enjoy food or even feel stressed that's not what he's saying what i am saying is that when you are out of balance it's because these first three energy centers are out of balance and imagine if all three of these survival centers become overstimulated all at once you can easily see how your body's energy would diminish over time. I'm going to pause right here because if you remember Anna from chapter number one, in the very first chapter, her traumatic event that basically started the domino effect of things starting to go worse and worse and worse and worse. Losing a loved one or a spouse has got to be one of the most horrible experiences I think that anybody can endure. I you would think that that's about as, you know, the worst that could ever possibly happen. But as you saw in Anna's case, that just led to a daisy chain of other series of unfortunate events because she didn't catch herself to stop them and her body over time and over it having to carry the burden of that extreme stress, it just started to break down. And you saw she ultimately ended up with cancer and it was just a terrible mess. So back to the book. What I am saying is that when you are out of balance, it's because these first three energy centers are out of balance. And imagine if all three of these survival centers become overstimulated all at once, you can easily see how your body's energy would diminish over time. And when that happens, there is not much available energy for growth, repair, healing, creation, or even just to returning to balance. So by the same means, many people who feel out of balance may retreat from their lives and limit the amount of food they eat. Let's stop right here. So if you're noticing that, wait a minute, it says here, many people who feel out of balance, have we ever felt out of balance and we felt that we had to retreat from your regular life and limit the amount of food that you're eating? I know a few people who do that, who they retreat from all of society and they're basically hermits locked in, into a cave and they limit their eating, fasting. They <laughs> basically have, in some cases, become breatharians where they think that they can nourish themselves just off of the breath, which we're not going to argue if they can or they can't on that. But basically, you get the gist of what I'm saying. But it also should signal to you that you have an issue with your first, your second, your third, or all three, or some combination thereof, with your three energy centers, because that is not a normal, healthy state of being. That is a state of being out of balance. Okay. It's the doctor that's saying it. So, and it's not just one doctor saying it. There's a whole a whole body of science with scientific papers and research to back all of this up, which I think Dr. Joe has done a brilliant job bringing it all in all together in this particular book, Becoming Supernatural. So back to the book. They may also abstain from sexual intercourse for a period of time to allow the body to restore itself. During their retreat, they will also remove themselves from the constant stimulation they normally receive from their environment, including their friends, kids, co-workers, appointments, schedules, jobs, computers, homes, and cell phone. This helps the body keep from reacting consciously or unconsciously to all those familiar elements in their outer world that they associate with thoughts and emotional memories from the past. So the breath technique I'm about to teach you gives you a way to liberate that trapped energy that is actually stored in the first three energy centers. So it can be 
free to flow to the brain from whence it came. And when you use the breath to liberate those emotions, that energy now becomes available for higher purposes. You'll have more energy to heal yourself, create a different life, manifest more wealth, or have a mystical experience, to name just a few. Those are just a few possibilities. So those emotions that are stored in the body as energy will be transmuted into a different type of energy, carrying a different message through the elevated emotions of inspiration, freedom, unconditional love, and gratitude. It's the same energy. It's just locked up in the body. The breath is a way to pull the mind out of the body. You will be using your body as an instrument of consciousness to ascend your energy, turning those survival emotions now into creative emotions. And as you free this body from the chains of the past and liberate this energy, you have available energy to do the uncommon now, to achieve the supernatural. It's really exciting. Okay, so now we've got the body as a magnet. So think about a magnet. As you look at figure 5.3, magnets, of course, have polarity. They each have a north pole and a south pole. And one end and one end has a positive charge and the other end has a negative charge. So the polarity between the ends of the magnet is what causes the magnet to produce the electromagnetic field. So the stronger the polarity between the two poles, the larger the electromagnetic field the magnet produces. So you can't see that electromagnetic field, but it exists and it can be measured. So I'm gonna stop here for a second because most people can't see the electromagnetic field. Some people, however, we know, without a shadow of a doubt, can see the electromagnetic field known as the aura. It's another term for that electromagnetic field. In science, they also call it the torus, T-O-R-U-S, or toroidal field, T-O-R-O-I-D, toroidal field. So this electromagnetic field has a light spectrum to it. And so you've seen in a lot of the different classical paint, paintings, you'll see different people where they're, you see a gold aura or a white aura or a different colored um, aura around angelic beings or certain individuals. And so we all have that aura. And again, some people can see them, other people can sense them. So, and some I would imagine can do both. So a magnet, has a measurable, invisible electromagnetic field surrounding it. The stronger the polarity between the North and the South Pole, the more current moves through the magnet and the bigger the electromagnetic field. I'm gonna stop right here. What relevance does that have to you and to me? What this is telling you right here is that as you get balanced with all eight of your energy centers and you start to use your breath to move the energy and bring it up and down, and instead of your cerebral spinal fluid taking 24 hours to get two cycles of it to rotate, you're now with every breath, let's say you do 60 breaths in an hour, now you have 60 cycles in an hour. So instead of 22, in an hour, now you have 24 in an hour because you did a full hour of meditation. Well, guess what? Because there's more energy flowing up and down you, your electromagnetic field is not just getting stronger, but it's also fanning out. It tells us right here, the bigger the electromagnetic field with the greater the polarity between the north because you have a positive charge on top of your head and you have a negative charge at the base of your spine, which also corresponds with your feet. The earth being the largest magnet here, we are standing on this giant magnet. And as we do this breath, we're fluffing up, we're expanding and fanning out our electromagnetic field. That's an automatic byproduct of you doing the meditation and doing the breath, okay? So that's the relevance that it has to you. And that's why it's so important. So the strength 
of a magnet, electromagnetic field can even influence matter. If you were to take a tiny metal shavings and lay them on a piece of paper and put another piece of paper over that first piece of paper and then set a magnet on top of the second piece of paper, those metal shavings would organize themselves within the magnet's electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field of the magnet is in fact so powerful, it's powerful enough to affect material reality, even though the frequency of this field exists beyond your senses. And if you look at figure 5.4 in the book, it actually illustrates this. So the electromagnetic field of a magnet will organize metal shavings placed under it into the field, into patterns of its field. So the earth, as I mentioned before, the Earth is a magnet, and like any other magnet, it has a North Pole and a South Pole, as well as an electromagnetic field surrounding it. So, so I'm gonna stop right here. Just as we as human beings, individuals, we have our electric magnetic field, the Earth, which I mentioned before, is the largest magnet. It has its North Pole corresponding to our head and its South Pole corresponding to our feet or the base of our spine and it has its own electromagnetic field as well. So while this field itself is invisible, we're all familiar with one amazing way to see that it exists. The Earth's electromagnetic field deflects the sun's photons and during a solar flare or a mass coronal ejection, that field deflects trillions of photons hurled up towards the Earth in a pulsating, colorful, colorful, colorful phenomena known as the Northern Lights. Yes, your body is also a magnet. Ancient cultures, especially the Asian cultures, have known this for thousands of years. Your North Pole is your mind and brain, and your South Pole is your body at the base of your spine. So when you're living by the hormones of stress, the emotions of survival, or when you're overutilizing the other two survival energy centers, you're constantly drawing this energy from this invisible field. The energy then no longer flows through the body because the body in survival mode is pulling the energy from the field and storing it in the body, specifically in the first three energy centers. This is what happens when the thinking feeling loop we talked about earlier is activated. So if this goes on long enough, the body won't have any electrical charge running through it at all. That sounds painful, doesn't it? And without any electrical charge, it can't create the field of electromagnetic energy that normally surrounds it. And when that happens, the body is no longer like a magnet. Now it's like a piece of ordinary metal, a magnet, that lost its charge. As you can see in figure 5.5, the body then becomes more matter and less energy or more particle and less wave. So when there is a flow of energy moving through the body, just as with a magnet, there's a measurable electromagnetic field surrounding the entire body. And when we're living in a survival mode and we're drawing from this invisible field of energy, you're trying to pull it from your electromagnetic field, and you're drawing from the invisible field of the energy around your body, we diminish our body's electromagnetic field. And in addition, when energy is stuck in the first three energy survival centers, it's because we are caught in a thinking and feeling loop. Then there's less current running through our body and there is less of an electromagnetic field. So of course, if there were a way to get this energy that's stored in the first three centers moving again, the current would resume flow and the body would recreate the electromagnetic field. The breath does just that. It gives us a way to pull the mind out of the body and to move all that stored energy that's locked up from the first three energy centers up your spine, it goes up your spine to the brain, restoring the electromagnetic field surrounding the body. And once that happens, we can use that energy for things other than for survival. So now let's take a look at the way our physical bodies are constructed so we can understand what makes that possible. 
So your sacrum, your spinal column, and your skull are the bony structures that protect the most delicate system in your body, the central nervous system, which controls and coordinates all other systems. Now, if you take a look at figure 5.6, you have a bone at the base of your spine called your sacrum. And that looks like an upside down triangle with a plateau on top. On the top of that flat surface sits the spinal column, which extends all the way up to your skull. Inside that closed system is the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. And the spinal cord is actually an extension of your brain. So the skull and the spinal column protect this most delicate system. The central nervous system is one of your body's most important systems because it controls and coordinates all the other systems of the body. And without the aid of the central nervous system, you couldn't digest your food. You couldn't void your bladder. You couldn't move your body. Your heart couldn't beat. You couldn't even blink your eyes without the nervous system. So you can think of the nervous system as the electrical wiring that runs the machine of the body. Pause. So this is just like the wires that are in the attic of your house that are behind the walls that make it possible for you to have electricity so that you have lighting and you can power any of the things that you have inside of your house. The inside of the house is like the inside of the body. The electrical wiring that's in the walls, in between the walls, in the subflooring and in the attic of the house are just like the wiring that's in your brain and that's in your spine. So now inside this closed system is a cerebrospinal fluid that is filtered from the blood in the brain. This fluid bathes the brain and the spinal cord, and it is responsible for giving the central nervous system buoyancy so that it floats. It acts as a cushion to protect the brain and the spinal cord from trauma, and it flows in various rivers and paths that transport nutrients and chemicals to different parts of the body and the nervous system all over the body. So by its very nature, this fluid acts as a conduit to enhance electrical charges in the nervous system. So now let's go back to your sacrum. Every time you inhale, the sacrum bone flexes at the bottom of your spine. It flexes ever so slightly. And every time you exhale, it flexes forward. So it's actually moving back, back and forth, back and forth, just a bit. So this is an extremely subtle movement too. Subtle for you to notice, even if you try, but it happens. And at the same time, you inhale, the sutures on your skull, the joints between the individual plates of your skull, which fit together like pieces of a puzzle and give the skull a degree of flexibility. It's basically like this, because you have, if you look at a diagram of the skull, you'll see that it's together with babies, it's you know open at birth, and then it's a soft spot, right? But as an adult, it's like this, it's together. But as you inhale, it opens. As you exhale, it closes. And I love that. In the advanced training, when we go to the monastery, we actually see, um, we actually see a film of an X-ray of someone. You can actually see all the bones inside the person's body, and they've X-rayed the spine of an individual who's actually inhaling and exhaling and inhaling and exhaling. They're actually doing this breath. And you can see how the tailbone goes back and forth and back and forth. And you see how the sutures of the brain actually open and close, open and close. It's like a pump. So it's making your cerebral spinal fluid go up and down and go up and down and go up and down. So this is an extremely subtle movement too, and too subtle for you to notice, even if you try, but it happens. I'm gonna stop right here, because if anybody tells you, oh yeah, I can feel my sutures opening and closing your brain, that's BS, that's impossible. Why? Because any neurologist will tell you the brain has no feeling. When they do surgery, when they do brain surgery, they have to give you anesthetics to crack open the skull because the skin of your skull feels and your, you know, your, it'll obviously, that's going to be very painful. The brain in and of itself though, 
they never anesthetize the brain. They can poke, prod, cut. When they do removals of brain tumors, they don't have to do anesthetics on the actual brain organ. It's only on the cranium, the skin, the part where they're entering the brain to access the brain. So, but as he says, it happens. So at the same time you inhale the sutures of your skull, the joints between the individual plates of your skull, which fit together like a puzzle and give the degree, give the skull a certain degree of flexibility. They open up just slightly. And as you exhale, they close back up again. This is extremely subtle, but you can't feel it happening. So the movement of your sacrum back and forth, it's also a very, you know, my hands, it's going to be a big movement, but with your actual sacrum, it's a very subtle movement. And as you slowly breathe in and out, along with the sutures of your skull, opening and closing, this propagates a wave within the fluid of this closed system. And it slowly pumps up cerebral spinal fluid. And you know, as you exhale, you release it and it comes back down because gravity pulls it down. And so the fluid goes up your spine all the way up and it's passing through the chambers called the cerebral aqueducts or ventricles. And if you were to tag one molecule of cerebral spinal fluid and follow it from the base of your spine and have it travel all the way up to your brain and then all the way back down your sacrum, you would see that it takes 12 hours to complete one circuit. That's why I mentioned it takes 24 hours to complete two cycles. So in essence, you flush your brain twice a day. Check out figure 5.7 to see what that actually looks like. So as you inhale, your sacrum slightly flexes back and the sutures of your skull expand. As you exhale, your sacrum slightly flexes forward and the sutures close. And it, it is the natural action of breath that slowly propagates a wave to move cerebral spinal fluid up and down the spinal cord and throughout the brain. So think about what would happen if you contracted the intrinsic muscles of your perineum, your pelvic floor, the same muscles that you use for intercourse and elimination, and you lock them down now, you isolate them. And then while they were locked down, you next contracted the muscles of your lower abdomen, locking those muscles down. And then you did the same thing with the muscles of your solar plexus and your upper abdomen. If you kept on squeezing and contracting these muscles, you're gonna have a six pack. Well, he never says that, but I have noticed that you do get tighter around your midsection because you are actually using those muscles. But those muscles in your first three energy centers, by contracting your core muscles, that fluid in your central nervous system would move up as illustrated in figure 5.8 of the book. Take a look at it. So you'd be moving that cerebral spinal fluid in your central nervous system up your spine. So each time you tighten the muscles of those centers, the fluid would be forced upward. So now imagine where you place your attention on the top of your head. Where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So if you put your attention at the top of your head, that would become your target for moving energy. Now think about taking one slow, steady breath through your nose and at the same time squeezing and holding the muscles as it travels up your perineum, then up to your lower abdomen, to the upper abdomen. And while following your breath up your spine and through your chest, your throat and your brain, all the way up to the top of your breath, your head. So imagine that when you get to the top of your head, you hold your breath for as long as you can. And you keep squeezing. You'd be pulling the cerebral spinal fluid up all the way up to the top of your brain. So as you contract the intrinsic muscles of your lower body and at the same time, take in a slow, steady breath through your nose 
while placing your attention on the top of your head, you accelerate the movement of cerebral spinal fluid toward your brain and you begin to run a current, just like the current that are in the electrical wiring of the building that you're in. You're beginning to run a current with intention on purpose, greater activity through your body and up the central axis of the spine. So that's significant because cerebral spinal fluid is made up of proteins and salts in a solution and the, and the moment proteins and salts dissolve in solution, they become charged. If you take a charged molecule and accelerate it as if you would, as if, uh, as you would if you pull that molecule up your spine, you create an inductance field. An inductance field is an invisible field of electromagnetic energy that it moves in a circular motion in the direction the charged molecules are moving in. So the more charged molecules you accelerate, the bigger, more powerful the inductance field. So now you're gonna take a look at figure 5.9 to see what an inductance field looks like. I'm not gonna show it because you're gonna have to buy the book. You're gonna have to check it all out. And the truth of the matter is, if you're serious about making a change in your life, just going through this once isn't gonna be enough. You gotta dive in deep and reread, apply, study, apply, study, apply, study, probably ask a lot of questions and make certain tweaks in what you're doing, how you're doing the meditations in order to get the right effects. So, cerebral spinal fluid is made of charged molecules. As you accelerate charged molecules in one direction up the spine, you produce an inductance field that moves in the direction of the charged molecules. As the inductance field is created by the acceleration of the cerebral spinal fluid up the spine, it will draw the stored energy in the first three centers back to the brain. Once there's a current flowing from the base of the spine all the way up to the brain, the body becomes like a magnet and an electromagnetic torus field is created. Think of the spinal cord as a fiber optic cable that acts as a two-way highway simultaneously communicating information from the body to the brain and from the brain to the body. Every second important information is relayed from your brain to your body, such as the desire to walk across the room or to scratch an itch. At the same instant, a lot of information from the body is carried up your spinal cord toward the brain, such as knowledge of where your body is in space or the signal that you're hungry. So once you accelerate these charged molecules in one direction up the spine, the resulting inductance field will reverse the current of information flowing from the brain down through the body. And it will then draw energy from the lower three energy centers back up to the spine, to the brain. So take a look at figure 5.10a to see how that works. Now there's a current running through the body and the central nervous system, just like a magnet. And as a result, the same kind of electromagnetic field of energy that surrounds a magnet surrounds the body. As you can see in figure 5.10b, the field of electromagnetic energy you've created is a three-dimensional field. And as it's moving, this energy creates a torsion field or a torus field. By the way, the shape of this electromagnetic field is a familiar pattern in the universe. This pattern shows up in the shape of an apple, as well as in the shape of a black hole in a distant galaxy. So you can look at figure 5.11 for this. So from apples to black holes, the shape of a torus is a reoccurring pattern of creation in nature. So now you understand that by doing this breathing technique, you're starting to stir up all this stored energy in a very big way. And if you do this technique correctly, and you do it enough times, you are going to wake up a sleeping dragon. Imagine that. What could you do with that if you awoke the sleeping dragon within you? Who knows how many years you've had all this stored energy inside you? 
It's just sitting there, just waiting to waiting for you to remember and wake it up. It's up to you. Evolving the energy to the brain. So once this energy becomes activated, the sympathetic nervous system, a subsystem of your autonomic nervous system that arouses the brain and the body in response to a threat in your outer environment, turns on and the energy begins to move up from the body's lower three energy centers to the brain. But instead of the body being aroused because of some external condition, you are turning on the sympathetic nervous system by passionately engaging the breath from within as the sympathetic nervous system starts to merge with the parasympathetic nervous system, another subset of your autonomic nervous system that relaxes your brain and body, such as after a big meal. It is as if traveling energy from the lower centers is ejaculated into the brain. So when this energy reaches the brainstem, a gate called the thalamic gate opens up and all that energy is permitted to enter the brain. Once this energy that was initially stored in the body enters the brain, the brain now produces, drum roll, gamma brainwave patterns. We've recorded many students producing gamma brain waves during this breathing technique. Gamma brain waves, which I call super consciousness, are notable not only because they produce the highest amounts of energy of all brain waves, but also because that energy comes from within the body instead of being released in reaction to a stimulus in the environment, the outer world. In contrast, the brain produces high range beta brain waves when the body releases stress hormones, allowing you to be super alert to danger in your environment. Now in beta, the outer world seems more real than your inner world. But while in gamma, waves create a similar type of arousal in the brain, which then causes a heightened sense of awareness, consciousness, attention, and energy related to more creative, transcendental, or mystical experiences. The difference is that in gamma, whatever is happening in your inner world becomes much more real to you than many experiences you've had in your outer world. So take a look at figure 5.12 and review how similar beta and gamma brain waves are. So through the release of the energy that is actually stored in the body's first three energy centers, the brain becomes aroused and moves into gamma brain waves. When this occurs, the brain may go into high beta brain waves on the way to the gamma range. High beta brain waves are typically produced by the arousal of the brain through stimulation from our outer environment, which causes us to put our attention on the cause Gamma brain waves are typically created by stimulation from our inner environment, which causes us to pay attention to whatever it is that's going on in the inner world of our mind. Inside here and here. This comparison shows how similar high beta and gamma brain wave patterns are, though gamma frequencies are much faster. So many of our students who do this breath technique produce significant high beta brain waves on their way to the gamma range, the highest frequency brain waves. So, or they may simply stay in these very high level beta states. So we're finding that being in the highest levels of beta can also signal that person is paying more attention to their inner world than to their outer world. So in addition to seeing more energy in the brain after this breathing technique, we have also repeatedly observed significant amounts of brain coherence. So take a look at graphic 6A and 6B in the color insert. You can see two students who have done the breath successfully. They have high frequency beta brain waves that transition to gamma brain waves and notice the high amplitudes of their brain waves in gamma. The higher the amplitudes, the higher the energy in their brains and the students 
demonstrate 160 and 260 standard deviation above typical gamma brain waves. So to give you a reference, three standard deviations above normal is usually considered high. Three. So in graph 6A, if you look in the book, graph 6A4, you can also witness much more brain coherence after the breath. The red patterns in the brain show extremely high amounts of brain coherence in every measured brainwave state. The prana tube is a tube of light or energy that represents the movement of life force up and down the spinal cord. And the more energy moving along the spine, the stronger the field of the prana tube. So the less energy moving along the spine, the weaker the prana, and thus the less, the less life force delivered in the body. So as you do this powerful breathing technique, you are drawing the energy that's being stored in those lower third three energy centers, the energy you, you use for an orgasm and to make a baby and to digest a meal, to run from a predator. And instead of releasing it out into chemistry, you're going to draw it up your spine like you would drawing fluid up a straw. And you're gonna release it into your brain. Pause here. It's no wonder some people feel like they're having a heart gasm or people are having brain gasms. They actually have an orgasm, an orgasm of the heart or an orgasm of the brain. Can you imagine that? Who wouldn't want to sign up for that? I mean, I remember one lady saying, oh my gosh, after the first time she had experienced that, she's like, oh my gosh, I'll never need my husband again. And I'm like, oh, I thought that was hysterically funny. But wow, I mean, need I say more? Okay, back to the book. In fact, there's a tube of energy or light called the prana tube running along your spinal column. So see figure 5.13 in your book. Prana is the Sanskrit word for life force. Yogis have known about this tube, which is not a physical structure, but an energetic one for thousands of years. And this tube is considered etheric because of the electrical information in the spine that constantly moves through it. So the more energy moves in the spinal cord, the more energy is created as light in this tube. And the more energy created in this tube, the more energy moves in the spine and the greater the expression of life. So sometimes when I teach people this meditation, people will say to me, I don't, I don't really feel, it says, uh, I don't really feel my prana tube. Well, you don't really feel your left ear either until you put your attention on it, right? So when I ask you to contract your muscles and pull that energy up, you'll be pulling it up through the spine and creating a more powerful prana tube along your spinal cord. So it's important to add here that this is not a passive breath. It's an extremely active, passionate process. So moving the stored energy energy that has been stored for years and years and years, maybe even decades, take an act of intention. That's attention inside is intention. It takes an act of intention and will. So to evolve your limited survival emotions as an alchemist turns base metals like lead into gold, you are taking self-limiting emotions like anger, frustration, like anger, frustration, guilt, suffering, grief, and fear, and turning them into elevated emotions, such as love, gratitude, and joy. So other elevated emotions to consider tapping into include inspiration, excitement, enthusiasm, fascination, awe, inspiration, wonder, appreciation, kindness, abundance, compassion, empowerment, nobility, honor, invincibility, uncompromising will, strength and freedom, not to mention divinity itself. Being moved by the spirit, trusting in the unknown or in the mystic or the healer within you. Oh, 
it's such a powerful place to be. I wish everybody could experience this without exception. So re remember, evolving this energy takes a level of intensity that is greater than the body as the mind, greater than the addiction to any survival emotion. You must be inspired to become more energy than matter, using your body as an instrument of consciousness. Ooh, it kind of startled me, sorry about that. Using your body as an instrument of consciousness to ascend your energy. So don't let your body be your mind. Remember that you are liberating your stuck energy, turning guilt or suffering or anger or aggression into pure energy. And as the body liberates that energy, you're freeing yourself and you will feel overjoyed, in love with life, and inspired to be alive. And as you pull this energy up the spine, in this meditation, you'll follow your breath all the way to the top of your head. When it gets there, I want you to hold your breath while you keep squeezing those muscles in your perineum and in your lower abdomen, upper abdomen. And when you do that, you increase the pressure inside your spinal cord and the spinal column. That pressure, called intrathecal pressure, is inside a closed system. It's the same pressure you exert when you take a breath and lifting something heavy. You're pushing against your insides. But in this breath, you'll be very specifically directing all that pressure, all that energy, and all that spinal fluid up your spine and into your brain. Okay, I'm gonna have to pause for just a quick second here because I need to plug this in or I'm gonna lose I'm going to lose power and we wouldn't want that. So let me plug this in. So here we go. And that, that's why we had the little sound here. I haven't had that happen before, but doesn't matter because it's happening now. Okay, so I apologize for that pause. So where were we? So as the thalamic gate opens up, a lot of the creative energy that was stored in the body passes through the reticular activating system to each thalamus and the pineal gland. Then that energy is relayed to the neocortex producing gamma brain waves. So let's talk a little bit about that. The RAS. Uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Um, actually, I'm Bill Nasby, who passed away just a little shy of two years ago. He would talk about the RAS because the RAS, <laughs> the, reticulating, the reticulating activating system, that is the thing in your brain that goes off when you decide, let's say, um, let's say you're looking to buy a car and you decide to buy, okay, I'm going to buy um, a Mercedes 500 as an example. Uh, I'm going to buy a white Mercedes 500. So now you decide you're going to buy a Mercedes 500, 500 and you go ahead and you buy it. And now all of a sudden you start to notice all these other Mercedes, white Mercedes 500s. You're like, where did all these white Mercedes 500s come from? I never saw so many, never noticed so many before. And now all of a sudden I seem to see them every, everywhere I go all the time, everywhere. It's like there's a preponderance of them. Well, it's not that they weren't there before. It's that they weren't on your radar before until you bought your own. And now that it's brought to your awareness, now your body knows to look for it. Your brain is wired. Your RAS, your reticulator, reticulating, activating system, now knows to be on alert for that. It's no different than you sometimes hear, hear people who they find money on the floor all the time because that's on their RAS, because it's in their heightened field of awareness, they, that's why they see it all the time and they're able to recoup all sorts of just idle cash that's sitting on the floor. You know, $50 bill here, another dollar here, quarters, nickels, dimes, yada, yada. So that's how your brain is wired, okay? So when that pressurized fluid reaches the back of your brain stem, all of a sudden the lower brain centers like the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the limbic brain open up to this energy through a cluster of nuclei called the reticular formation. So that energy then passes through the thalamic gate up to the thalamus, the part of the brain that relays signals from the sensory receptors located in the midbrain, which serves as a junction box. 
Next, all of that stored energy moves directly into your higher brain cortex, the neocortex. That's when gamma waves begin to occur. So when the energy reaches the thalamus, it is also related to the pineal gland and something amazing happens. That gland releases some very, very powerful elixirs. One which anesthetizes the analytical mind and thinking brain. Isn't that amazing that we actually have a little pharmacy inside our brain that creates a neurochemical that anesthetizes the analytical mind and the thinking part of your brain. Amazing. So see figure 5.14, which shows the thalamus, the reticular, the reticular formation, the thalamic gate, and the moment of the energy hitting the higher brainwave centers. So we're going to talk more about the pineal gland in a later chapter, but for right now, know that when that happens, it's like an orgasm in your head. This is a very powerful energy that has been called the movement of the Kundalini. I personally don't know like I personally don't like to use that word. This is what Dr. Joe is saying. He says, I personally don't like to use that word because it may conjure up opinions or beliefs from a limited understanding of this energy that may discourage some people from doing the breath. But I do want you to understand that this is the energy you are evoking with this breath. So if you look at graphic 6B, number four, in the color insert, you can see the area surrounding the pineal gland, which is quite active in the student producing gamma brain waves. So look at the blue arrows and the red area suggests the activation of the energy in the pineal gland, as well as a region of the limbic brain associated with strong emotions and formations of new memories. Graphic 6B5 is a three-dimensional picture of the same student's brain. Once again, the pineal area shows a significant amount of energy coming from inside the brain. Embracing elevated emotions. You've just read how the breathing exercise in this chapter pulls the mind out of the body as it liberates stored energy from the first three energy centers the centers of survival. And once you do that, it's time to reconduct, recondition the body to a new mind. The second part of the meditation, which involves attaining elevated emotional states, I wanna clarify here why embracing elevated emotions is so powerful. As you've learned from our discussion about genes in the second chapter, we know that it's the environment that signals the gene not the other way around. If an emotion is the end product of an experience in the environment, it is the emotion that turns gene expression on or off. So when you embrace these elevated emotions in this meditation, what you are actually doing is signaling, you're triggering, triggering your genes ahead of the environment. The body doesn't know the difference between an emotion created by an experience you are having in the outside environment and an experience you're creating internally by embracing this new elevated emotion. So when you embrace that elevated emotion and think thoughts, you're thinking thoughts that are greater than the self-limiting ones that kept you stuck in the past, your body begins to prepare chemically for the future because it thinks that that future is happening right now. So in other words, if you do the meditation correctly, enough times the body responds as though the healing or any condition you are manifesting in your environment has already taken place. So these elevated emotions have a higher and faster frequency than more base emotions like guilt, fear, jealousy, and anger. And since all frequency carries information, when we change the frequency, we change the energy. That new energy can then carry new information, a new consciousness or set of intentions or thoughts. The more elevated the emotion, 
the faster the frequency and the more you feel like energy instead of matter. Little rewind here because this is super important. The more elevated the emotion, the faster the frequency and the more you feel like energy instead of matter. And the more energy becomes available to create a more coherent energy field, shifting further away from disease and more towards health or for that matter, towards signaling any gene. So when your emotions are self-limiting, on the other hand, they have a lower frequency and you feel more like matter instead of energy. And then it takes more time to create change in your life. You're gonna feel heavier. You're gonna feel denser. You're gonna drag more because you feel the weight of the material form of your being instead of instead of being in a state that's running more light and more electricity through it that is has more wave forms of potential energy in addition to particle and not just one so here's an example if at some point in your past you were shocked betrayed or traumatized by an event with a high emotional charge that has left you feeling pain or sadness or fear chances are that experience has been branded into your biology in numerous ways. It's also possible that the genes that were activated by this experience might keep your body from healing. So in order for you to change your body into a new genetic expression, the inner emotion you create has to be greater than the emotion from the past outer experience. So the energy of your empowerment or the amplitude of inspiration must be greater than the pain or the sadness. Did you catch that? Did you really catch that? Because it's really important that you recognize if you've had some sort of traumatic incident that caused you a great deal of pain and trauma, PTSD, whatever, whatever the case might be, it says here very clearly, the inner emotion you create has to be greater than the emotion from the past outer experience. The energy of your empowerment or the amplitude of your insp inspiration must be greater than the pain or sadness that's causing this illness, just like Anna in chapter one. So now you are changing the inner environment of the body, which is the outer environment of the cell. The genes for health can be upregulated while the genes for disease can be downregulated. The more profound the emotion, the louder you're knocking on the genetic door, and the more you're going to signal those genes to change the structure and function of your body. That's how it works. We can actually prove this because in one of our 2017 advanced workshops in Tampa, Florida, we measured gene expression in a randomized selection of 30 workshop participants. The results showed that our students were able to significantly change the expression of eight genes over the course of a four day workshop by changing their internal states. There is only one possibility in 20 that the results were due to chance. That's the threshold of significance that statisticians usually use. So the functions of these genes are far ranging. They involved in neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons in response to a novel experience and learning, protecting the body against various influences that tend to age cells and regulating cell repair, including the ability to move stem cells to the sites in the body where they are needed to repair damage or aging tissue, building cellular structures, especially the cytoskeleton. That's the framework of the rigid molecules that give our cells shape and an actual form, eliminating free radicals, and so decreasing oxidative stress, which is associated with aging and many major health conditions, and helping our bodies identify and eliminate cancerous cells, thereby suppressing the growth of cancerous tumors. Activating the genes for neurogenesis was particularly significant because most of the time our students were in meditation, they were so present 
in their inner world of imagination that their brains believed they were in the actual event. So see figure 5.15 below to learn what each of these genes does and why it is important for our health. These are the specific genes that were regulated in four days, just four days, in our advanced workshop in Tampa, Florida in 2017. So if our students have changed their gene expression by creating elevated emotions in just a few days, imagine what you can do if you practice this meditation for a few weeks by using this breath technique to release the familiar emotions stored in the body for, from years of thinking and feeling the same way. And then by emotionally rehearsing new states every day. With practice, these unlimited emotions will become the new normal for you. Your brain will think different thoughts equal to those elevated emotions. Finally, by embracing these unlimited emotions instead of the same limited emotions that when you understand that you are signaling the genes and making new proteins that are responsible for the change in the structure and the function of your body, you can assign more meaning to what you are doing. That leads to a greater intention, attention inside, intention, which creates an even greater outcome. It, don't you want an outcome? Of course you do. This creates an even greater outcome. It is a scientific fact that we use about 1.5%. This is incredible. We use only 1.5% of our DNA. The rest is called junk DNA. There is a principle in biology called endowment that holds that nature never wastes anything that is not going that is not going to be used. So in other words, if the junk DNA is there, there must be a reason. Otherwise, nature in its infinite wisdom would have evolved it away because the universal law is if you don't use it, you lose it. So think of your genes as a library of potentials. There are infinite combinations of gene variations that can be expressed in those latent genes. They're waiting for you, for you to activate them. There are genes for an unlimited genius mind, for longevity, for immortality, for an uncompromising will. Ooh, I'm going to seize that one too. For the capacity to heal, for having mystical experiences. Got it. For regenerating tissues, got it, and organs. For activating the hormones of youth, got it. So you have greater energy and vitality for photographic memory and for doing the uncommon, just to name the few. So I'm going to read this again because this is just so juicy. The list of all the potentials that are here, just waiting for you to claim them in meditation and add an elevated emotion of joy, happiness, love, and gratitude so that then your order is fulfilled and then you let go. So they are waiting for you, not the neighbor, not Superman, not the government, not some savior, not some rescue party. You, it's you, baby. They're waiting for you. I'm looking at you on the camera right now. Yeah, we're waiting for you to activate them. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. There are genes for an unlimited genius mind. Would you like that? Check mark, I want that. For longevity, check mark, I want that. For immortality, check mark, I want that. For an uncompromising will, check, check mark, I want that. For the capacity to heal, check mark, I want that. For having mystical experiences, check mark, I want that. For regenerating tissues, check mark, I want that and organs and for activating the hormones of youth so you have greater energy and vitality check mark i want that for photographic memory check mark actually i have that already <laughs> and for doing the uncommon just to name a few it's all equal to your imagination and creativity as you signal any of those genes ahead of the environment 
your body will express a greater potential by expressing new genes to make new proteins for a greater expression of life. So when I ask you to feel certain elevated emotions, when you recondition the body to a new mind, know that as you embrace each emotion, you are knocking on your own genetic door. So I invite you to surrender to the process and fully engage in the experience. Reconditioning the body to a new mind meditation. Before we start the formal meditation, you're going to do some practice sessions and they build on several individual instructions so you can learn this step by step. And once you've mastered each individual step, we can put it all together. So let's start by sitting up straight in a chair and putting both feet flat on the floor or sitting on the floor in the lotus cross-legged position with a pillow under your buttocks. Place your hands uncrossed, uncrossed hands on your lap. And if you like, you can close your eyes. When you're ready to begin, lift up your perineum, your pelvic floor with the same muscles that you use for intercourse and do not hold your breath as you do not do this. Breathe normally. Squeeze those muscles as tightly as you can and hold for five seconds and then let go and relax. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005 and then relax. So do it again and hold it for the same amount of time. Do it a third time. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. So do it three times. I want you to gain conscious control over these muscles because you're going to be using them in a different way. So now contract the same muscles in the perineum and at the same time, contract the muscles in your lower abdomen. Pull your lower abdomen up and in, locking down these first two centers. I'm doing it right now as I'm reading this. Hold for five seconds and relax. Pull those same muscles up and in and again, squeeze. Hold for five seconds again and then relax. Repeat this once more. Remember to keep breathing as you do this. Don't hold your breath. Now this next time, squeeze the muscles of your perineum and at the same time, you are going to squeeze the muscles of your lower abdomen while also contracting the muscles of your upper abdomen and you're tightening your entire core now, the first three energy centers. So you're tightening, tightening, tightening. It's traveling upward like this the first three energy centers. So you're gonna hold all those muscles for five seconds and relax. You do this again, pulling the muscles in a little more this time. Hold for five seconds, then relax. Now do it one more time. And as you squeeze and hold those muscles, see if you can squeeze them a little tighter and lift them a little higher. Hold for a little while and relax. Since experience, creates neurological networks in your brain. As you perform each step and build on the previous one, you are installing the neurological hardware in your brain in preparation for the experience. I'm asking you to use the same muscles that you might have been used, used, used to for years, but now you're using them in a different way. And this action will begin to milk these centers and liberate energy that's been stored in your body for a very long time. Now we're going to change it up. Take your finger and place it on the top of your head and work your fingernail right into the center of your scalp so you will remember where that spot is. And once you take your finger away, remember that where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So that point, that's your target. Put your hands back in your lap and without contracting any muscles yet, Take one slow, steady breath through your nose. All I want you to do is follow your breath from your perineum, through your lower abdomen, through your upper abdomen, through the center of your chest, through your throat, all the way to your brain, all the way to the top of your head where your finger was. When you get to the top of your head, you're gonna hold your breath 
and keep your attention right at the top of your head and let your energy follow your awareness. Hold for about 10 seconds and relax. Place your finger on the top of your head again and then take it away and make sure you can feel the point without your finger there. Rest your hands on your thighs. Now do one more breath without contracting any muscles. And this time, when you inhale through your nose, imagine you are pulling that energy up a tube, like drawing fluid up a straw, all the way to the top of your head. When you get to the top of your head, hold your breath for about the same time you did before. And let your energy follow your awareness and then relax. Now it's time to start putting it all together. With this next breath, when you inhale through your nose, pull those muscles up and in at the exact same time. Start by locking the muscles of your perineum, engaging the muscles of your lower abdomen, and simultaneously contracting the muscles in your upper abdomen. And as you squeeze the muscles in each center with the intention of pulling all of that stored energy in your lower body into the brain, follow your breath through each of those three centers. As you continue to squeeze those muscles and lock those first three centers down, pull your breath up through your chest, the fourth center, and then through your throat, the fifth center, and then to your brain, the sixth center right here. Put it all the way to the top of your head. Keep your attention there and hold your breath as you keep squeezing your core muscles. You keep squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. Hold for about 10 seconds and then relax as you exhale. Repeat that breath at least two more times, tightening the muscles. Your first three centers as you pull up your breath, your spine, you're pulling the breath up your spine through each energy center all the way to the top of your head. Then you hold your breath when you reach to the top. Then you hold the breath for a time and finally you relax as you exhale. Remember, as you do this, you're using your body as an instrument of consciousness. And your, your full intent to sh should be to pull the mind out of the body. You're liberating energy that has been locked. Oh, gosh, I apologize. This, I don't know how this fell off again, but it did. I apologize, guys. Okay. So you're liberating energy that has been locked in your lower three centers and moving it up to the higher centers where you can use it for healing your body or creating something new instead of just for survival. So practicing this many times so you are very familiar with these steps will be useful before you begin several of the meditations in this book. Be patient with yourself. Just like learning anything for the first time, you have to do this many times before you truly master it. In the beginning, it may feel awkward because you have to synchronize the actions of your body with the intention of your mind. Eventually though, if you practice this technique enough, you'll be able to coordinate all of these steps all in one motion. So I'm aware that there are many different breathing techniques and you may well have had success with one or more of them in the past. Even so, I urge you to try this one, even if you already have some other favorite because if you do something new, you can have a new experience. If you keep doing the same thing, you will keep creating the same experience. And if you do nothing, you get nothing. So yes, this technique takes some real effort, but once you become more skilled, you'll see it's worth the effort and then some. So you are now ready to begin the formal meditation. I wanna hit pause here for a second and just point out, Dr. Joe Dispenza does mention that Kendall, who is a scientist, who is a researcher, who actually found out that when you when the brain is doing habitual tasks, the neural networks of the brain, there's um, 1600 neurons that fire and wire and sync together in order to continue moving forward with something that is a habit. But when you are learning something for the first time, the number of neural circuitry doubles. So instead of 1300, you have 2600 neural circuitry and neurological pathways of the brain that are formed in order to learn something new. And as you continuously 
you keep on repeating that, then you have deeper and deeper grooves within the brain brain and you have that neural circuitry starts to get more embedded and more embedded into the brain until it becomes a habit. So it is in your best interest to exercise your brain, learn something new, apply it, reapply it, practice it so that you have that benefit. It's literally, as you learn something, it literally makes you more intelligent. It actually increases your intelligence. So I think that is such fascinating information to know. So you are now ready to begin the formal meditation. And if you purchased my Reconditioning the Body to a New Mind CD or audio download from drjoedispenza.com, pause. I'm going to encourage you right now. If you don't have it yet, it's $6. Jump on drjoedispenza.com. Download it. You go into his meditations, into his store. You'll see Reconditioning the Body to a New Mind breaking the habit of becoming yourself uh, meditations you actually get two for the price of one you get the body parts meditation and the water rising med meditation with that breaking the habit of becoming yourself breaking the habit of being you is the, the short one anyhow just go to the website get it it's the best six dollars you will ever spend it is fantastic and it's a great meditation to um, put you in a state of in induction because he has you do, actually most of his meditations seems to be more pronounced to me in, the, in that particular meditation for body parts and the water rising. Um, I, I really feel something pretty cool in that uh, meditation. So it's one of my favorite meditations and it's the one that I recommend to everybody off the gate, you know, right off the bat, you know, start with that. And then as a third meditation, then get blessing of the energy center. Whatever, you know, if you feel more inclined to get the blessing of the energy centers first and then breaking the habit of being, becoming yourself, doesn't matter. But like I said, for six bucks, you have two phenomenal meditations. One's like an hour and 19 minutes. The other one I think is like an hour and almost 30 minutes or close to an hour and a half, both of those meditations, but they're fantastic. So you'll find the recording includes a song I've specifically chosen to truly inspire you to raise your energy. And as you listen, I want you to interpret the music as the movement of energy. So if you do the meditation on your own, practice the breath while you listen to one inspiring song that's between four and seven minutes long. Then open your focus, putting your attention on different parts of your body, as well as the space around those parts of the body. Next, unfold as pure consciousness into the unified field, staying in the generous present moment and becoming no body, no one, no thing, nowhere, and in no time. Now it's time to cultivate several elevated emotions, one by one, emotionally rehearsing each. Remember, the more powerful your feelings, the more you are upregulating your own genes. So bless your body. Bless your life, bless your soul, bless your future, bless your past, bless the challenges in your life, bless the intelligence within you that is giving you life. Finish by giving thanks for a new life before it has been made manifest. And that is the end of chapter six. So, if you have any questions, any comments or concerns, feel free to message me in the comments below here on YouTube. I love, absolutely adore to hear from you and interact with you and love to be of service if there's something that I can do to help. Um, if we have more than one or two people who are engaging in a lot of questions, we can do a YouTube live where we just ask, you know, have you ask me whatever questions and we answer them live in real time. If uh, you just want to ask privately your question, you can do that too. It's all up to you. Thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets TV. This concludes chapter five of Breaking the Habit of Being You. Thank you. Remember to keep heart coherence and brain coherence. And if you're watching this, let me know if you have Go Love 20. Are you affected by Go Love 20? Let me know if you are. Ciao for now.